I want to examine uh, today the four major ways that the surplus of value can change in capitalism. Marx devotes something like six, seven hundred pages of capital on these four ways, and so I want to go through in some uh, detail with you uh, each of these ways and their importance. So the, the issue here is how can a capitalist acquire more or sometimes face less surplus, surplus value, that is profits, um, in the development of capitalism. And don't forget, the more or less surplus value is connected to this K star plus lambda, and therefore the expansion and contraction um, in the economy. The first one that Marx, there's four ways now, the first one that Marx talks about is what's called absolute, I call by him, absolute surplus value. So this is an, an example in which the capitalist can acquire more surplus by paying the workers the same V, but getting them to work longer hours. Let me just put that on the board here. So absolute surplus value. That's one way. Here, the, what the capitalists do is pay the workers the same value of labor power, so I'll borrow it, the same lab, labor power, but they get the workers somehow to work more hours. So in a sense, you have the length of the workday, which is H, which we developed. You're paying the workers a V. This is the surplus the capitalists get. But by extending the length of the workday, the capitalists are getting a greater living labor. The use value of labor power is, is, is as it were, is, is extended. So if, the, if you have a new workday like this and you can pay them the same V, then you can see that the surplus has risen. So absolute surplus value is an example of a rising rate of exploitation. If you can expend, again, extend the length of the workday and pay the workers the same fee. So that's one way. A second way that Marx talks about is getting more surplus, expending the massive surplus for the capitalists with the same rate of exploitation. So the second way is to increase the mass of surplus with the same rate of exploitation. Very briefly, the second way. I'm going to go through these in, in detail, but just to get them <coughs> all in front of you at once. Massive surplus with the same rate of Let me take this surplus, okay, and I want to rewrite this now, okay? So the surplus, surplus, the, the so I'm rewriting this, is equal to S over SV over V okay, times V. So I haven't done anything. Okay? You know, V over V, it, it crosses out with like a surplus is equal to surplus. So I just want to rewrite this. So S over V times, what is V? That's the value, the small V, the value per labor per worker, there's my L, which stands for the number of workers hired, times the number of hours that each works. So the, I'll put it up here, the total value of labor power in capitalism is the value per worker, that's from the last lecture, I defined that for you, value per worker, times the number of workers, times the hours each work. I've been assuming L is equal to 1, but it doesn't have to be that. We can have more, so we can introduce that. Notice what we have here now. If we keep the rate of exploitation the same, we don't change it. That's the, we're not doing absolute. We're keeping the rate of exploitation the same. We pay the workers the same value per labor hour, and we don't change. We keep the same length of the workday. Then the surplus can grow if we have more employment. So that Marx is going to develop this example. He's going to say the capitalist can get more surplus, can get more surplus by employing more workers with the same length of the workday, the same paying them, the same wage per hour, per labor hour, with the same rate of exploitation. So that's the second famous example. The third example, I'll put right over here, is called relative surplus value. Marx spends a lot of time on this one, and we will too. Relative surplus value is an example in which the value of labor power falls, the surplus rises, don't forget our theory, if the value falls, 
Remember, the capitalists are producing, I'm sorry, the workers are producing a value added, okay? They only, the workers only get a share of that, the value. So if you squeeze the value, you reduce it, the total surplus rises. And Marx calls that relative surplus value. Let me draw that one. Okay, remember now, workers go to work, they produce then a total value over the length of the workday. If you keep the length of the workday the same, so the total doesn't change here, you keep it the same. Okay, so let me, this was their V, this was their surplus. But if somehow you can reduce the V, if you can reduce that, then the surplus will have to grow to more than what it was before. Because you're pushing the V in this direction, you're reducing the V, and hence you got more surplus, and the capitalists enjoy that higher rate of exploitation. The question is, how does this happen? Well, remember what we did last time. The value of labor power is equal to the, 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 the price of an apple, the exchange value per unit value of the apple, times the number of apples, the means of subsistence. Well, no, look at this. If this thing is falling, one way for this to fall is for this to fall, even if this stays the same. People are still consuming, what was it, a quarter of an apple. But if that apple is becoming cheaper in value terms, then the value of labor power will fall. Yeah, this is fascinating. Okay. Because we already went through this course, and you studied in volume one, that a rise in the productivity of labor, a rise in the productivity of labor, will reduce the unit value, which will cause the value of labor power to fall, which will cause the rate of exploitation to rise, which will produce a rising rate of profit. This is fasc fascinating and interesting. Marx developed this argument in, in volume one, and we're gonna come back to it because of its importance. So in any case, that's the third way. The final way, <clears throat> I'm gonna erase this one over here. The fourth way that Marx discusses in the middle of volume one for the capitalists to get more surplus, so this fourth way is this equation that we developed, which is V plus surplus divided by the number of workers and the hours that they work. It's possible, we call that, if I remember correctly, I. Okay, Marx calls this the intensity of labor. Intensity of labor, that's why I'm calling it the I. It's possible that even if you have the same hours and the same workers for them to produce more value added if you can get them to work faster during the same, get the same workers to work faster during the length of the workday. In other words, this is called, in, in capitalism, speed up. You accelerate the work of the workers. And if that's the case, and if you can pay those workers the same V, you'll get an increased surplus. This pay them the same workers, they're adding more value, then obviously the ratio has to increase via speed up, which is the fourth way, okay? So now I wanna go back and I wanna examine each one of these in, in detail. The first one we're gonna examine is this absolute surplus value. And you know, I don't think we have to spend too much time in this. I hope this is obvious from what we have done. Here we have, a, once again, I'll just rewrite it. We have an extension of the workday. If this is the length of the workday, then what the capitalists are trying to do is extend it, but pay the workers the same V that they were paying them before. So then the surplus has grown from here, the old, to the new. So the capitalists have an interest in extending the length of the workday. The workers, on the other hand, have an interest in not extending the length of the workday. Why? Because the workers are getting the same V, all these workers, but they're working longer hours. Okay, so this is H is rising, you can see, and hence the wage, the little v, per labor hour is falling. So there's more wear and tear on their labor power. So notice something. The capitalists are interested in extending the workday to get a higher rate of exploitation, higher profit rate, and expand. The workers are interested in not doing that, in, in, if anything, in, in, in contracting the length of the workday, 
okay, if they're going to get paid the same, you know, wages here. So the interests of the capitalists and the workers are going in different directions. But before the market, they're equivalent, okay? They both have equivalent rights as buyers and sellers in the market. So Marx, the, Marx makes the following argument. Between, which way is this going to work out? Well, between equal rights, force will decide. So what he expects is in capitalism, one of the first struggles to arise in capitalism will be over the length of the workday. And indeed, as capitalism develops throughout the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century, there is a struggle over the length of the workday. And to make a long story very, very short, is this is a struggle in which the workers win. Okay? In just about every industrial country or, uh, you know, around, around the world, as capitalism develops and grows and this struggle emerges between capitalists and labor, the workers organize unions and so forth, etc., recognized by the state, and they win a shorter work week. And hence, if there's no other changes, the rate of profit should fall for the capitalists because it, it's not going in this direction, it's actually moving in that direction. The length of the workday is shortening and the workers are getting to pay the same wages and hence the surplus is squeezed for the capitalists. Okay? So the rate of profit should fall. In fact, it doesn't. The rate of profit doesn't fall for the capitalists. The rate of profit goes up and that's going to tell you the importance of these other three mechanisms to offset this falling rate of profit that we just you know, articulated by a, uh, a struggle that's won by workers. So let me go now to the second one, okay? The second one I want to examine here is this, this I'm not going to say anything more about the, the, the uh, absolute surplus value, but I want to examine the second one because it forms a major portion of Marx's argument in Capital, and it's a very, very important story of, of capitalism in just about every country around the world and has been for, for some decades now. Oh. So the second one is when capitalists expand the mass of surplus by employing more workers, more productive laborers with the same rate of exploitation and the same length of the uh, workday, and let me just add to it, and I'll show you why, with an unchanged composition of capital. So I'm going to assume that the index of mechanization doesn't change, the rate of explo exploitation doesn't change, the wage rate uh, per labor hour doesn't change, but yet surplus still grows. I mean, all those things can change, and they do in volume one. So I'm just holding them constant just to focus on this particular aspect of capitalist expansion, which is an expansion of productive labor employment to show how it affects uh, the surplus of the capitalists. So here's your example. Okay, so they've got a C plus V plus S is equal to W. Okay, and I'm going to use numbers here. I, make, I hope to make it easier. The capitalists, I'm going to assume, use up, use up $80 worth of machines and raw materials plus $20 of labor power plus $20 of surplus, so the total value is $120, okay? Now here's other ratios here. The intensity of labor, okay? The intensity of labor is what? Well, the workers yield to the capitalists a total value numerator, divided by the labor hours they work. We don't just have L. Again, again, L is not equal to 1. We have more workers here. So in this particular case, they yield a total value of $40. That's their value added. And I will assume that we have 20 workers. I'll write it over here. We have 20 workers, and each worker is working 10 hours. So if we have 20 workers in each of those workers is working 10 hours, we have a pool of 200 labor hours. That's again, that's what the capitalist gets. That's the use value of labor power of all these workers, 200. So I'll put here 200, that's the pool of labor hours. So every single hour, the workers yield, all the workers yield 20 cents, okay, every single hour. That's the intensity of labor. Next uh, 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 index. I want to take, the, 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 this is a new one, I want to take the ratio of the raw materials used per labor hour. Okay? This is a technical ratio. In this case, every labor, you know, we have 200 labor hours. The workers require 
of value of what? Of means of production. So this is the value of the means of production per labor hour. So in this case, it's uh, 4 2 zero 8 four, 2 fifths. So every single labor hour that the workers work, they require $2 of means of production to produce whatever it is they're producing. Okay, so these are the numbers that I'm going to play with now. Ready? Now let's assume everything stays the same, save for one change. I'm going to now have employment grow from 20 to 30. I'll call this the new. The H will stay the same. I could change it, but I'm going to just focus on this. So I'm going to have an expansion of employment by what percentage? Well, you can do this. The employment is going to grow by, let's see, that's 30 minus 20 over 20, 50%. So what the delta L, Greek letter delta, what that stands for is the new employment, I'll write it out, the new minus the old. So that's the change, that's the change in jobs, employment of what? Of productive labor, labor that's productive of surplus. So I'm assuming that the capitalists go out and they expand employment, they now hire 30 rather than uh, 30 rather than 20 workers, giving me a percentage increase of 50%, a half hefty rate of increase. Okay, so I have employment growing by 50%. So let me get rid of this. And the question is, okay, if we have now um, uh, 30 workers, how much new value do those workers add if they're working the same hours of 10? Well, we have this formula we can make use of now. We have Let's see, we have a question. What is this? We don't know, okay? If I assume that the I remains unchanged, so the intensity of, it could change, but if I assume for the moment it remains unchanged, then I have a new pool of labor hours. I'm just solving this equation here. And this is new. The H remains the same by assumption. So I can plug in the numbers here. So this is one-fifth, because I'm assuming there's no change in the intensity of labor. There's no speed up. It stays the same. But I now have L times H. Let me see. This is 30. This is 30 times 10. So I have now 300. The use value labor power has grown. This is now 300. And I have, therefore, $60 of value added by these workers because we're employing more productive labor. We have more value. If the rate of exploitation remains the same, and if we have $60, then the new, the new equation here has to be 30 here plus 30. Why? Because I'm assuming the same rate of exploitation. So if it's the same rate of exploitation, the rate of exploitation can't change if the you know, if you, the surplus has to grow at the same proportion as the value of labor power, hence to get an unchanged rate of exploitation, that gives me the 30 plus the 30, unchanged rate of exploitation. The only one, last one I need is what is the C? Well, if I assume that the uh, index, this index remains unchanged, there's no change in the technology, so I can calculate the new C, I'm gonna erase this now, I can calculate the new C that's needed, okay? From, from, from this. Don't forget what this is. This is the C divided by LH. So I can calculate the new C, which is two-fifths. I'm assuming an unchanged technology. So it could change. I'm assuming it's unchanged. Times the new labor, which is 30, times the hours that they work, which is unchanged, is 300. So what is that? Two-fifths times uh, 300 is uh, 60. So the new C is $120 of value. Not terribly surprising that it grows because we have a growing employment. So this is the new value being produced by the capitalists when they employ more, 150, 180, sorry, when they employ more uh, uh, workers. So this has grown from this to this. This is the new equation, this is the old equation. 
Notice the surplus has grown from 20 to 30. Value of labor power grows from 20 to 30. The value of the means of production grow from 80 to 120. We're employing more productive labor. Now let's, in the, in the last few minutes, let's examine this a bit more carefully to see what Marx has produced here. So I'm going to erase all this. Let's go back to some of our indices. First, let me see, 80 plus 20 plus 20 is 120. What did I have here? 120, 120, 120 plus 30 plus 30, 50 is 180. Okay, this is the old, this is the new. What's the growth in capital accumulation? Well, let me see now. We have delta C is equal to 40. Delta V is equal to 10. So let's do this. Delta C plus delta V over C plus V. That was your K star. Is equal to 40 plus 10 divided by 100. That's 50%, right? How about delta surplus value, the change in surplus value, the rate of growth of surplus value? Well, that's 10 over 20. That's 50%. This is a remarkable result. What Marx has shown here, that if you hold everything constant, save for, except for the growth of employment, you get the following result. The rate of growth of employment, change of L over L, is exactly equal to K star, which is exactly equal to the rate of growth of surplus. So I'm starring these to indicate this is a rate of growth. Well, I, by the same logic, I can star this too, I suppose. Now let me quote Marx. A theory of capital accumulation, a theory of capital accumulation is a theory of employment growth and is a growth of profits as well. So if the capitalists accumulate capital, they take a portion of their surplus that they pumped out of the workers, they purchase more workers and more means of production as I just showed you in this example. So they're employing more workers, they're taking their surplus again, they're accumulating more C, accumulating more V, they're growing employment, they're also growing their surplus and the rate of growth of capital is the rate of growth of employment. So, in the, as you all know, when you're going to hear this, we have a recession. So let's make use of this. A fall in the rate of accumulation. If K star plus, if K star falls, employment is going to fall. Bango, we have a recession. So we now have an explanation of one part. There are many possibilities. So one reason why we might have a recession. Capitalists don't accumulate as much as they might otherwise. Employment's going to grow. The demand for means of production, the demand for consumer goods is going to fall. Bango, we have a recession. Okay? So Marx develops then, it gives an explanation of how we can have more employment or less employment in the society. And the reason is it's connected to what capitalists do with the surplus that they uh, uh, pump out of workers. The next step then, and I'm, I'm going to do this, uh, develop this the next time, is to uh, discuss the consequences. What, what's the consequence of growing capital accumulation and growing employment on the economy? So we have, you know, to back it up, just to make sure. If capitalists accumulate, they take out of their surplus and they do this, this K star, they employ more, they get more profits. What's the result of that, that expansion, which is quite wonderful? What's the result of this expansion on the capitalist economy? And what Marx is going to, to anticipate what we're going to do, what Marx is going to show is that expansion, that growing capital accumulation, growing employment, growing in profits, growing demands by workers um, in the economy, is going to set the conditions for a contraction, for a recession. So let's put it together. An expanding economy, K star is equal to uh, uh, L star, an ex and equal to, to surplus value star. An expanding economy 
is going to create the conditions for a contracting economy. That's the business cycle. The ups and downs of, this, of the uh, economy under which we live. And the way he's going to develop this is to show how this growing capital accumulation and growing employment is going to impact two markets. There are many markets, but he's going to show in, in these two. The labor power market and the means of production market. So the growing K star, in English, the, 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 the delta C plus the delta V divided by uh, C plus V, the delta C is going to affect the means of production market, the delta V is going to affect the labor power market, and basically what's going to happen in those two markets is that the demands for labor power, for workers are going to rise, the demands for machines and raw materials are going to go rise. That's going to cause, in turn, if there's no change in the supply of those inputs, rising prices. Those rising prices are going to, in turn, cause rising costs to the capitalists, the rising costs of wages, the rising costs of raw materials and machines. And that rising cost, if there's no other changes, is going to undermine capitalist expansion and produce a contraction. So when the seeds of expansion by the possibility, because as, as I'll show you also, it's not inevitable, by the seeds of the contraction. Inside capitalism is not just exploitation, but is the business cycle. And we shall stop there. <laughs>